well-regulated militia be necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I'm so glad you're with me on the program today. We're going to be talking about what's going on in New Mexico. Zach Ford is the uh, treasurer of the New Mexico Shooting Sports Association, also the named plaintiff in Fort versus Grisham. That was the uh, lawsuit, well, one of many lawsuits filed. Uh, that one in conjunction with the Farms Policy Coalition the uh, Second Amendment Foundation, and the New Mexico Shooting Sports Association. Uh, and that was the uh, case that went before uh, Judge Urias in New Mexico, in which he granted a restraining order against Governor Michelle Luan Grisham's executive order suspending the right to carry in Albuquerque and Bernalillo County. Again, we're going to be talking with Zach Ford in just a second uh, about the latest with the lawsuit, as well as the uh, latest legislation that we might be seeing here in the uh, upcoming session. Uh, and a uh, poll, we wrote about this at Bearing Arms, showing widespread opposition uh, to the governor's executive order, including from independents and Democrats across the uh, land of enchantment. We'll get to that here in just one second. Before we do, Biden's America is crushing us. You've got companies laying off tens of thousands of workers, one after the other. Americans working two jobs just to get by. Inflation pushing hardworking families to the brink. Just look at the price of lunch meat next time you go to the grocery store. And a digital dollar could be coming down the pipeline to completely destroy your way of life. The truth is, you need a plan. You know it, and I know it. And that is why you should call Gold Co. So you can diversify your savings and investments with gold and silver before things get worse. They're a six-time Inc. 5000 winner, 2022 Company of the Year, with thousands of five-star reviews. And they've helped people like you and me place over $1 billion in gold and silver. They're offering up to $10,000 in free silver while supplies last. And if you call them today, qualified callers will get a free Ronald Reagan half-ounce silver coin. So don't wait. Call Gold Co. at 855-412-3806 today. That's 855-412-3806. Again, very pleased that uh, Zach Ford could join us on the program to talk about not only the initial order uh, from the New Mexico governor, again, trying to unilaterally declare that the right to carry was off limits in the state's most populous city and most populous county. Uh, but where we go from here? So we talked not only about the governor's uh, revamped order, uh, this new poll that uh, was commissioned by the New Mexico Shooting Sports Association, but also, again, a, a preview of what we might be seeing coming down the pike here when uh, lawmakers return to Santa Fe in January. Take a look and a listen. Zach, thanks so much for coming on the show, sir. It's good talking with you. Thanks for the opportunity to talk with you and your listeners. A- absolutely. Um, you know, we've got a lot to talk about uh, because even though the governor has, you know, scaled back this emergency order, there is still, I think, a lot of moving parts, it sounds like, uh, w- w- with what's going on in New Mexico, uh, including this poll that was released a couple of days ago. Now, mm-hmm. tell me about this. Um, the Mexico Shooting Sports Association, you guys commissioned this poll. Um, mm-hmm. But but from what I've been able to tell, this is a I mean, this is a legit survey, right? Thirteen hundred and some odd likely voters. That's the screen that was used and truly bipartisan opposition to what uh, Governor Luan Grisham was doing here. Yeah, exactly. So uh, to your point, you know, that's about fourteen hundred likely voters from across the state of New Mexico. The polling firm that did it, Coefficient, uh, they have a B plus rating from Nate Silver's group at five thirty eight that does kind of uh, rating. So they're kind of, you know, they're right there. Uh, you know, they're a well rated uh, national polling agency. And because we wanted to, you know, get us get a. Get a get the feel for what New Mexicans were thinking about this. Uh, and what we found was broad bipartisan opposition uh, among, you know, Republicans, independents, and Democrats. People are opposed to what she did. Uh, I think, you know, 68% was kind of the top line number that opposed. I think you had around maybe like, you know, 15 to 20% support of what she did. And I think that shows the need, the need to continue to engage with people on this issue. Um, that, you know, people carry, people do carry firearms on a daily basis to protect themselves. And we need to put a great greater uh, voice to those people to make sure that because we really wanted it to be 100 percent. But, you know, when you do a, when you do a professional poll, you get the result, you get the honest answer. Uh, so I think what also some of the numbers that really stood out to us, too, on this poll was 90. I think it was 91 or 92 percent of New Mexicans think the problem is criminals over firearms, meaning that the number one problem that we face is just criminals who do say who commit crimes with zero accountability in the state of New Mexico. So that's one of the things that really stood out to us is how much agreement there was that that's the top issue we face. It's not firearms themselves. It is the people who commit acts with these firearms and never face any consequences for their actions. 
Absolutely. And we've heard that just anecdotally. And, you know, I, I've been reading a lot of news stories, uh, whether it's, you know, TV stations or the Santa Fe Reporter. Uh, there was a uh, I think it was either a column or a letter to the editor of the Albuquerque Journal today, a concealed carry holder who talked about mm-hmm. having a gun pointed at her uh, in a road rage incident and how, again, she's a concealed carry holder. Right. She's not the problem. Um, but but according to the governor, she is the problem. Right. It's concealed carry holders who are to blame. Uh, And she just, you know, her attorney during this court hearing said, well, the governor just wants the the ability to try. Right. She just wants to try to do something about violent crime. That's not the issue, Zach. She was trying to do something to make it impossible for law abiding citizens in Albuquerque and Bernalillo County to protect themselves. That's the issue here. Yeah, exactly. Um, she was trying to nullify the Second Amendment. That's what she was trying to do through executive order. I um, mean, actually, if you followed our governor's actions through COVID, you would find she had some of the, the heaviest handed, longest lasting emergency orders in the country. And I think this was kind of, you know, she the courts didn't stop her there on letting her do whatever she wanted for as long as she wanted. And, you know, it wasn't actually till earlier this year that the COVID emergency health orders in New Mexico actually expired. I um, mean, on that point, she actually tried to shut down gun stores mm-hmm. during the pandemic uh, through these orders. And my organization, the Mexico Shooting Sports Association, we sued her over that, too. Uh, we won that because uh, she as soon as we filed suit, she immediately dropped that. Uh, but she's been trying to push the envelope of executive power and she tried something new. And I think one of the, that's why we have to fight it so hard here in New Mexico, because if she gets away with it in New Mexico, you're going to see a whole lot of states across this country really quickly use public health orders to effectively nullify the second amendment. Were you surprised that the backlash you received, not from gun owners necessarily, but from the Bernalillo County DA, from the mm-hmm. police chief in Albuquerque, the Bernalillo County Sheriff, the attorney general, um several democratic lawmakers were, were you know it really does seem like uh, you know rather than craft this you know uh, with her top consultants and her top advisors and getting buy in from the legislature i think it was the bernalillo county sheriff who said i found out about this a couple of minutes before she made her announcement what 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 is going on behind the scenes zag do you know uh what actually led to the governor deciding you know what i'm just going to try to nullify the second amendment through an executive action Uh, without consulting my fellow Democrats, without consulting local law enforcement to see if they'll enforce this. Why did she take this step? You know, um, she is someone who likes to, as we've seen, really likes to take steps to executive action. Uh, The the longer she's been in office, kind of it seems that the more insular that her kind of group has become and that they really don't listen to other people. You know, she's picked a lot of other fights, uh, you know, without we're not going to go down too many rabbit trails of New Mexico politics, but she started to pick some other fights with the Attorney General, General Raul Torres on a long running lawsuit over the Department of Education in New Mexico. So she really seems to be coming living in this more more insular world that she really relies heavily on executive actions to get her way or not do things that she doesn't want to do. She's also been highly protective. Uh, you know, we have a very dysfunctional uh, Children protect, Protective Services Department in New Mexico called CYFD. She has absolutely refused to let anyone, legislators, the attorney general, anyone, inter- try to help out the situation that it's it's in a terrible state. Kids are dying because of it, but she refuses to let anyone do it. She's become this more and more uh, just Everything has become more insular. Her group of advisors, anyone who's telling her not to do it, apparently she just fires them. Uh, so just she's living in the smaller and smaller world. That's why it's so important that we have to use the courts uh, to justify or to hold her in check. I mean, that's kind of what that's what we did with our lawsuit. Um, we also wanted to use this poll to show her, you know, you're going down the entirely wrong path. This is not what people are looking for. This is not what people want. And the and I, I just want to bring up really quickly, you know, she talked about the specific situation that there was a tragic situation in Albuquerque where a child lost their life. And that's kind of what I guess precipitated uh, that next action that she took. But they arrested the, perp- the three perpetrators who were behind that incident. All three of them were gang members. Several of them had outstanding warrants. They could not legally possess firearms. And it was a case of mistaken identity. Basically, the vehicle they shot into, uh, they believed it was a rival gang member. And so rather than, you know, making sure people who have warrants are arrested and have their day in court, making sure we keep people, violent people behind bars, she decided to go for this sweeping attack at gun owners. And I think there is some part of her that genuinely believes that because we oppose her politically, that we are the problem in this state. 
the gun owners because we don't agree with her that we have become the problem. I think there is a part of her that genuinely believes that. And that's why it's so important that we talk to gun owners all across the state because New Mexico, we're a very blue state. We're also mm -hmm. a very rural state. And so there's a lot of rural Democrats uh, who are gun owners who support their rights, but they still vote for some of these politicians who are very anti-gun. You know, this is why we have to constantly tell them, you know, you know, we're we're a single issue group. We're not going to tell you, uh, we're going to tell you that here are the voting records of the people who are on the ballot on this issue. And we just need to really begin to keep educating those people because a lot of them do not support what she did there. They did not support what she's done on other things in the legislature. And it's about that constant education and engagement that we need to have as gun owners to make sure people are aware of what she's doing and what she genuinely believes the problem in this state is. Absolutely. Um, all right. I want to, and I want to talk about the upcoming legislative session uh, because she <laughs> did announce that she would not be calling a special session, even though that uh, the number of folks who have uh, urged her to do that, I have mixed feelings about a special session given what we saw in Tennessee, but yeah. you know, when, when, uh, when the judge uh, in Fort versus Grisham, uh, which you are the named plaintiff um, yes. granted that restraining order, you know, the governor responded by saying, okay, fine. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to change my order. I'm going to amend it. And and now uh, now you can't carry in parks and playgrounds everywhere else. Fine. But now on my order, you can't carry in parks and playgrounds. Is that being enforced by the Bernalillo County Sheriff, by the Albuquerque police chief, by the uh, district attorney or the AG? Because after she made that 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 second announcement, I haven't heard anything about uh, mm -hmm. enforcement. So to the best of your knowledge, Zach, is that being enforced any more than her first original order was not that we've seen so far i would say that the the tro that we were granted at the initial hearing uh was is still in place our lawsuit is still in place the tro is still in place um where they did talk about parks in the initial order and in the initial tro uh the the, the one the kind of the one exception to the tro is she said you couldn't carry inside schools we did not challenge that because there's already laws around carrying guns at schools so we we kind of carved that we did meant we kind of we did specifically in our complaint we carved that out saying we're not challenging the prohibition on carrying in schools in this lawsuit because there's already a lot of legislation and laws around that state federally um but parts were included in our initial in her initial order and in the tro we said you know you have a right to protect yourself at a park um in albuquerque or uh, and in, really not just in albuquerque everywhere in the state and actually i don't know if people caught on to this uh she actually banned hunting on state land in that initial order that she put out that wasn't kind of the headline because you know the headline was you can't carry a gun in albuquerque but she actually banned hunting on, on basically all state lands in her initial order and that was one of the things we challenged because you know we had hunters groups coming up to say you know hunting season's getting underway and you just banned carrying you just ban carrying guns and shooting on hunting lands and that are owned by the state. So that was, fortunately, we were able to get that out so people can continue to hunt without a uh, problem. But um, our lawsuit, the next the next court date is October 3rd for the preliminary injunction. Uh, we can we will continue to challenge her order. Uh, we did ask for, I guess, what we call quote unquote nominal damages in our original complaint. That way that even though the governor has changed the order, we the people of Albuquerque and Bernal Bernal County, we suffer damages during those days before that TRO was put in, put into place. We have a right to carry a firearm outside of our own home. That's been that was codified in Bru in the Bruin case. It was about carrying a firearm outside your own home for for self-defense and other lawful purposes. So um, that's something that we're uh, we're going to continue to keep challenging this in court, and we anticipate uh, that the judge is going to continue to side with us, but we'll see what happens there. Yeah, it was it was interesting. I, you know, the the judge, I had a chance to listen to that hearing, and um, the judge clearly sympathetic for the, uh, you know, about the violent crime in Albuquerque, <laughs> right? And, and I suspect even somewhat sympathetic about uh, the, the governor's emergency order, but the Constitution is clear. The Bruin test is clear uh, and the governor simply doesn't have the authority to, again, unilaterally suspend the exercise of a, a civil right, as she tried to do here. Um, now, we are looking at another session coming up in January. Yes. What what are you hearing from lawmakers right now, Zach? Uh, because, you know, the, the Democratic majority rejected a number of the governor's proposals this year. Right. She wanted a 14 day waiting period, wanted to ban so-called assault weapons. Uh, I think there was one other. I wanted to raise the age to purchase a firearm from 18 yeah. to 21. Um, none of those bills passed out of the legislature. She uh, did not call for a special session, I think, knowing that the votes weren't there. Does the governor's power grab and then the smackdown that she's received, does this make it more likely you think that we're going to be able to find some bipartisan agreement on legislation that actually does go after violent criminals? Uh, or are you more concerned about uh, uh, some of the governor's proposals getting a 
um, you know, moving uh, in the next session here with Democrats trying to rally to uh, to, to to their party leader. So, you know, I think there, it could go a lot of different ways here. I think there is a little bit of hope that we're going to see some good movement on holding violent criminals accountable. Uh, I know there's been a, there has been some bipartisan work on that in the past, and we're going to and I'm hopeful that we can kind of see some more progress on that in the 30 day session. Um, we are going to see all of the bills that you mentioned, ba- bills on bans on semi automatic rifles, raise the age, waiting periods. All those bills are coming back. We actually knew those bills were going to come back even before uh, the governor kind of did this stunt, uh, just because you know. The governor had already made it clear that anything that doesn't pass during this last 60 day session is coming back next year, next 30 day session, Uh, which actually just really quickly for your your viewers information um, in New Mexico, we alternate 60 day and 30 day sessions. 30 day sessions are really just supposed to be about the budget alone, but this kind of turned into the budget and everything else the governor wants to hear, which the governor wants to hear stuff on guns. So we're going to hear stuff on guns. So just a little bit of context for viewers there when I talk about 60 and 30. So it's going to be a pretty wild sprint uh, this upcoming 30 day session. Uh, we know all those bills are coming back. You know, we were able to put to get to forge a coalition of conservative rural Democrats and Republicans in New Mexico to stop a lot of those bad bills. Uh, those legislators who we relied on, they will still be back at this upcoming 30-day session. Um, can I guarantee that all of them, that all the Democrats who have stood with us before will continue to do so? I can't guarantee that. That's something that we're obviously going to work towards, and that's our goal is to make sure these people continue to stand with us. But at the same time, you know, the governor has given us some really powerful ammunition we can use against her and say, this is what this governor really thinks about this, because the intent, the volume and the intensity around this issue issue was just turned way up by what she did in this executive action with all these people coming out in opposition to it and everything that she does on guns it's going to people are going we need to people to see through this lens like she's not interested in in attacking violent crime no one thought this was actually going to solve crime i think it was nine yeah. out of ten that this isn't going to do anything that it's she's just she doesn't actually care about crime. She just cares about attacking political opponents and trying to do everything she can to make their lives hard. So that's the case we're going to continue to make uh, during this upcoming 30 day session. You know, and of course, those uh, rural Democrats, they need to be hearing from their constituents as well. I- I'm curious. I spoke with a uh, firearms instructor last week who said that, uh, you know, he went from a few phone calls a week asking about classes. He, he just started he's doing this on sort of a part time basis uh, to a few phone calls a day. Uh, while the governor's order was, you know, technically in effect. Um, so there was an increase in interest in terms of folks who wanted their concealed carry license. I'm curious, um, did this help grow the membership of the New Mexico Shooting Sports Association? Are there more gun owners who said, you know what, I- I'm getting off the couch. I'm an advocate now for the yeah. Second Amendment. I'm not just exercising my right. I'm going to fight for it. Absolutely. We've seen an uptick in membership, especially uh, when we filed the lawsuit just through this. We had all kinds of people reaching out to us. You know, what are people doing? Because there, there's kind of a shock factor, right? She effectively tried to end an amendment to the Constitution through an executive order. Um, so there were definitely a lot of people who may not have, who were not as involved in the past, who are now getting involved. Uh, we've seen a big uptick in membership. We're seeing a lot of people. Um, so Because a lot of the people who are calling me, trying to you know, make sure that we got to file a lawsuit, they weren't just got, they were, you know, made could business groups they wanted action on this they were you know construction groups wanted action on this because they were they saw what could the governor could do through executive order so we We've seen a lot of groups from all across the spectrum, people who just believe in limited government. That's all you have to do to be on our side on this is just believe in limited government and checks and balances, because that's what she tried to effectively do by herself. Um, So we've seen a big uptick in membership. I think we're going to this issue. uh, She really shot herself in the foot, uh, so to speak, on this, even though she couldn't carry uh, to do so. But. We, like I said, there's been there's a lot of energy around this. A lot of people are paying attention. I've heard some anecdotal stories from gun stores that they saw an uptick in people wanting to go out and purchase firearms. Like, well, if the governor can't tells us we can't, uh, there's maybe that's when we should is when the governor tells us that we can't. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I just to kind of highlight that a little bit because this is something we've been tell, telling you know people in the media. A lot of the reason that people in New Mexico and Albuquerque carry a firearm in the first place is because they've already been a victim of violent crime. They saw something happening. They saw someone breaking into their neighbor's house. They called 911 only to be told the police officer would not be responding to the call. Um, in Albuquerque, the where you know where I live uh, and where this lawsuit or where the lawsuit's taking place, um, the priority one call response time for Albuquerque Police Department can be up to anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. You know, this is like someone is in your house threatening you, 
10 to 15 minutes. Um, lower priority calls, a lot, they may not respond to them. Um, I've heard from people that there are shootings um, in front of their house, some type of drive-by or something, and it takes 48 hours for the police to come and pick up bullet casings and take, a, take some photos and leave. Um, so that's the kind of, so that's why people own guns in the first place. It's just because they've realized that, you know, when seconds matter, the police may not be showing up at all um, in some of these situations. So that's why people are gun owners in the first place. Uh, this increase in crime has definitely driven an increase in this. And the governor highlighting how bad crime is, because we've been talking about how bad crime is in Albuquerque for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how this is all of a sudden an emergency when the governor told us very clearly two years ago when she was getting reelected that it was not an emergency at all, that it was actually very normal and very safe. But all of a sudden it becomes an emergency. She declares the emergency order. She then leaves to go to Texas. After declaring an emergency, she then goes to Taiwan after declaring the emergency. She hasn't really been in the state since declaring this alleged, this so-called emergency. So she doesn't believe it's an emergency. We believe crime is bad. We believe we need real solutions and people need to protect themselves. But this order that she did was completely out of line. It was unconstitutional. We're going to continue to litigate it. All right. Well, listen, Zach, I appreciate you joining me on the program today. Hope we can uh, keep in touch, uh, maybe reach out after Definitely. that next hearing in early October. Uh, in the meantime, if folks want to uh, lend their support to the Mexico Shooting Sports Association, either join as a member. I'm assuming you guys take out of town and uh, out of state memberships as well. Um, yeah, definitely. You do. All right. So we how can folks have... sign up? Uh, you can go to uh, online nmssa.org. Uh, go sign up there. I would say we, I think we actually have a member in Australia um, who support who sees the need for what we do and, and supports what we're doing out here. Uh, so, yeah, you don't need to be in a Mexican. I mean, I would say. Over 90% of our members are New Mexicans. You're not required to be a New Mexican uh, to be a member, but we, uh, you know, we we definitely appreciate the support because this is, a, you know, this is a new battle line that we've seen is taking huge actions through executive orders. And if it's allowed to stand in New Mexico, it's going to be all across the country here pretty quickly. So that people across the country need to be paying attention to what's going on in New Mexico and help us fight against this. Because, like I said, if it, if it's allowed to stand here, you know, Governor Newsom in California is, I'm sure he could find a lot of really creative ways to go after gun owners through executive orders. So. So it is so crucial that we fight on this battle line uh, that's been drawn right here in New Mexico. So we appreciate it. Everyone helping out, like I said, nmssa.org. Awesome. Zach, thanks again for your time, sir. Thanks for everything you do and look forward again uh, to continue this conversation in the very near future. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Well, thank you again to Zach for joining us on the program. And yeah, we're going to be talking with him again in a, a couple of weeks here after that next court hearing, which I suspect is also not going to go well for the New Mexico governor. Right now, let's turn our attention to today's Armed citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. We'll start there with a case out of California. A stabbing in the hills of Berkeley, man accused of killing his mother, has long criminal history. That, according to the uh, East Bay Times, I believe it is. Uh, let me make sure I've got the San Francisco Chronicle. Excuse me. This was uh, over the weekend. Berkeley police got a call around 1230 Saturday afternoon reporting a man armed with a knife about a one and a half miles north of the UC Berkeley campus. Neighbors told the East Bay Times that they heard a, quote, blood-curdling scream around the time of the attack. When officers arrived, they discovered that the assailant had stabbed two women and chased a man down the street. One of the women uh, was the suspect's mother. She died at the scene. Another woman treated for stab wounds at the hospital. A man treated for uh, at the scene for injuries to his hands. The attacker then stole a car and fled with the police in pursuit. The chase ended when he uh, crashed. At a nearby intersection, the suspect was arrested and taken to jail. Uh, identified as 36-year-old Jonah Jeremiah Gazzani Roper. Arrested on suspicion of murder, attempted murder, child abuse with possible great bodily injury, elder abuse, burglary, and vehicle theft. Uh, currently being held in the uh, Berkeley jail scheduled for arraignment on Wednesday. Booked into jail about to 1.02 p.m. Saturday afternoon. So just a half hour after that uh, crime was reported. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, police have not elaborated on the relationship between the suspect and the three victims, although, again, one was his own mother. Court records show that the suspect's stepfather was granted a temporary restraining order against Roper in 2010. It's one of three orders that have been granted against him uh, over time. Court records show that Roper had multiple addresses in Oakland and Berkeley, including the one where the fatal stabbing took place. He also has a long criminal history according to the San Francisco Chronicle, with more than a dozen arrests in California, Illinois, Louisiana, and Florida. In November of 2012, a little more than a year, uh, a decade ago, Roper charged with robbing the Bank of the Orient in downtown Oakland. At the time of that bank robbery, he was already on probation for a 2011 burglary conviction, as well as a 2011 conviction 
uh, for battery of a custodial officer. He was arrested in the bank hide after his probation officer recognized him from surveillance photos. Um, despite the fact that he was on probation for robbery when he was accused of committing a bank robbery in 2012, by 2014, Roper was already out. Arrested four times in a three-month period in Florida and Louisiana, charged with disorderly intoxication, petty theft, larceny, resisting arrest, all relatively minor crimes. In 2021, he was arrested in Chicago on charges of criminal trespassing, resisting arrest, as well as assault and emergency personnel. He was moved to the uh, Santa Rita Jail in Dublin, California after that arrest, so apparently he still had outstanding warrants because he was moved from Illinois to California. But again, despite a laundry list of criminal charges and convictions dating back more than a decade, Mr. Roper was uh, out on the street and allegedly able to uh, carry out this attack against three individuals, including his own mother, over the weekend. Again, California has plenty of gun control laws on the books. Not that they're working to stop violent criminals either, but, um, you know, maybe the issue is treating criminals as if they're criminals rather than trying to ban our way to safety by making it impossible to own inanimate objects. Today's Armed citizen story from Washington State. Uh, Fox News' Emma Colton reporting that would-be burglars armed with Billy Club picked the wrong farmer to try to rob. I will shoot, says the uh, farmer. Uh, this uh, farmer, uh, Sam Crouchshied, he had just bailed hay with one of his sons. He was headed to an Eric Church concert. He says um, he had to use his gun to protect his farm from suspected criminals. It was back on September the 9th, just before 7 p.m. Crouchshied left one of his fields and uh, corralled his three youngest sons in his pickup truck. They were going to go to the uh, Gorge Amphitheater to sing, uh, see Eric Church. And he said uh, they wanted to get some, quote, fancy burgers and just hang out and relax. Pretty good way to spend an evening. Uh, so as they're passing a farm store that he leases and is in the process of buying, he spotted a car outside the building. There wasn't supposed to be anybody there. So he turns around to investigate. He said, I parked, and I walked over, and I looked in the car, and there's a gas can in the passenger seat. It was a very small car, and in the back seat, there was a message, a massage table, and a weed eater, and some other stuff that screamed to me, you know, stolen items, right? So at first, he yelled out, anybody here? Didn't hear anything back. Um, but he knew that somebody had to have been on the property because, again, that car is there. So he went and he got his gun from his truck. He loaded it. He called 911 and let police know, hey, here's where I am. I'm at this farm store. I think there's a burglary going on. He said, I was approaching the corner of the building. I saw an arm. I saw somebody jump back, and I kind of cleared around the end of the building, and there was one individual close to me. He then saw another man coming towards him with what he described as a billy club. Crouchside said he pointed his gun and used his voice to yell at the man, get on the ground. One complied. The other put up a fight, claiming that they were there to rent the building. He said the guy in the back got down pretty quickly. The uh, front individual stayed up for quite a bit. He was somewhat defiant of the process. Maybe nervous, he said, to the point. I felt it was probably a couple of seconds away from having to put one on the ground next to him to try to get him compliant. But thank God, he said, I didn't have to. His three sons in the truck watching everything. He said they could hear me yelling and screaming, but they had no idea what I was dealing with. Didn't know if there was one person, two people, three people there. One of his sons actually texted his mom uh, and was letting his friends know about his dad holding these suspects at gunpoint. Uh, Crouchide said that um, Grant County, Washington, where he lives, is bigger than the state of Rhode Island. But he said uh, deputies able to make it to the property in about six minutes, arrested the two men. Uh, I guess both locals, 28-year-old uh, Jesus Rangel and 45-year-old Glenn Richard. Grant County Sheriff's Office able to prove the men were on the property for criminal purposes based on shoe prints inside the building. Crouchide uh, says that he is uh, thankful for the uh, investigation, also thankful that he had his firearm with him. He says, I'm lucky because I've had handgun and self-defense training classes. But in this situation, I was focused on these two individuals. I had four houses and a yard behind me and a building behind me. He said, I'm lucky that nobody was back in there. Uh, Crouchide also noted that the shop that had been targeted by the suspects was, quote, stripped to the studs because he's in the middle of purchasing it. They didn't take the stuff. He's just in the middle of, you know, getting it renovated. And criminals wound up trying to steal a few jugs of hand sanitizer as well as a set of keys. He said the incident is, uh, quote, 100% a prime example of why we should be exercising our right to keep and bear arms. He said, I told somebody I'm too old to take a beating from a billy club. And a friend joked to me, is there an age limit to that? And saying that if he had not had his firearm, he might very well have been assaulted by the uh, suspect who was holding the weapon. He said he didn't just bring the club to carry for looks. No, absolutely not. And again, able to uh, protect himself and his kids and his property, Without firing a shot, as is the case with the vast majority of defensive gun uses. Sam Crouchide in uh, Washington State, today's uh, armed citizen.
Finally, today's good deed of the day, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing down in North Carolina. You know, we had Tropical Storm Ophelia roll up the East Coast this weekend. It was not nearly as bad in the Farmville area as we were expecting, thankfully, just a, a couple of inches of rain. But, man, you got over to the east, and, uh, yeah, there was some pretty significant flooding southeast of where uh, I'm located as well, down in North Carolina also. Some bad flooding and an officer in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing to rescue a dog that was uh, tied up as the floodwaters are rising. And uh, this officer, again, able to uh, make that rescue in Greenville, North Carolina. Officer Benjamin Schultz uh, was uh, lauded by the Greenville Police Department on Facebook. The uh, post from the Greenville Police Department said the dog, a small pit bull, was tied to a fence. Just inches away from drowning, video showing a Schultz untie the dog, carrying it away to safety. As rain poured down, police say a good Samaritan called about the uh, pooch. Post said, without you, he wouldn't be alive. So not only uh, the officer in the right place at the right time, willing to do the right thing, but again, that alert resident seeing what was going on across the street, calling police and allowing Officer Schultz to uh, effect that water rescue and save that good boy. All right, that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. Hey, listen, I do want to say thank you to, uh, first of all, uh, the organizers of the Gun Rights Policy Conference. I am sorry that I could not be there in person this past weekend, but uh, I did have the chance to watch some of the GRPC. It was streaming online. Uh, you can go to the Second Amendment Foundation's uh, YouTube page or their Facebook page, and you can check out a lot of the speeches. But um, I was I, I was gobsmacked. Uh, when I learned that I had been named the Journalist of the Year at the uh, Gun Rights Policy Conference. So I want to thank Alan Gottlieb and all the folks at the Second Amendment Foundation uh, for the honor. It truly is uh, an unexpected honor. And I'm, I'm again, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I don't know what to say. I'm not going to dwell on it, but um, I just wanted to say thank you. I also want to let you know about, um, well, hopefully you know already by now, about the latest decision by St. Benitez, U.S. District Judge Roger Benitez, in the uh, Duncan case. Boy, it is so hard to keep track of all of these. This is the California magazine ban. Uh, Judge Benitez issued his decision finding that ban to be unconstitutional uh, late on Friday. Uh, had a chance to look over the opinion briefly. Ranjit Singh, my colleague, is going to have a, a piece getting into uh, one aspect of the judge's decision, but uh, we'll be talking more about the decision because it is not only is it a lengthy decision, I mean, this was written. I think clearly written with the Supreme Court in mind. I think Judge Benitez knows that the Ninth Circuit is historically hostile to the right to keep and bear arms. I think he was right in an opinion that is going to make it very difficult for the Ninth Circuit to overturn his decision. But I think he, again, is also writing to the high court because these magazine ban cases are going to be coming back to the Supreme Court. In fact, Duncan was one of those cases that was granted, uh, granted cert by the Supreme Court and then uh, vacated and then remanded back down to the Ninth Circuit for further review in light of Bruin. The Ninth Circuit then turned around and kicked the case all the way back down to uh, Judge uh, uh, Benitez, which didn't need to happen, but an attempt, I think, to delay the inevitable here from the uh, Ninth Circuit. Uh, so now Judge Benitez has issued this decision. It is as powerful a decision as I think that I have read. It absolutely obliterates the state of California's case that banning magazines that are in common use for lawful purposes uh, so it doesn't violate our right to keep and bear arms. He takes the state to task in a uh, excellent fashion. And again, we're going to be talking more about that at BearingArms.com. If you like what you see, by the way, when you visit BearingArms.com, I would always encourage you to become a VIP or VIP Gold member. All you have to do, go to BearingArms.com slash subscribe, use the promo code GUNRIGHTS, and you can get a significant savings on your VIP membership. As Ari was saying, thanks for doing your support. We're going to give you exclusive content you won't find anywhere else, news stories and analysis that matter, just like your backing. So again, thank you very much for all that you do to defend our right to keep and bear arms. That's going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free. <laughs>